My name is Wes Gear. I was the founding member of Head PE, played guitar with Korn. Since then, I became the founder of Rock to Recovery. Music was a big part of my childhood. My brother Jim had an acoustic guitar and he played Smoke on the Water. I was like, what is that? It really hit me. And that kind of planted that seed of being interested in that sound. Iron Maiden and Black Sabbath and Ozzy Osbourne. When I started getting into that, I was always drawn to the guitar and just was like, I have to make these sounds. I was just obsessed and I was gonna make records and I was gonna make music and I was gonna go on tour and I was unrelenting in my desire. I moved a lot from school to school. My parents divorced. I do remember constantly not having friends and how do I fit in and it felt very insecure. I always connected with the stoners, the rockers, the ripped jean wears, and weed was part of that. I had to have weed all the time. Smoke weed, play guitar for four hours, come out of like this weed hole, smoke some more, and go back in and play. So it was weed and drinking in high school, and you know, they say it's a progressive disease. By the time I got out of high school, it was weed, cocaine, and drinking. My life was just super unmanageable, and I couldn't figure out why. I got kicked out of my dad's house, I'm sleeping in my car, so it all came all together. I met a guy in Live Urban Sex Tribe, who was Jared, and we formed the band Head P.E. in the mid-90s. And we went down to the beach, Huntington Beach, because there was a vibrant scene there, L.A. was dead. We played it with the Deftones and Corn and Sugar Ray, and all of us played clubs together. First I was doing meth, holding a day job, and our band head was progressing and selling out shows and the record deal we could see it coming. Once I got out of this day job, I had no limitation to how much I could drink and use. I was on meth all day, every day for years at that point. So we went out with like Lincoln Park, and at this time Slipknot, if you were in the band, you weren't allowed to party. We were the opposite. We were maniacs. I mean, bands didn't want to take us on tour because of that. At the height of my career, when we're going out with like Corn on Follow the Leader, opening up in arenas, I'm having Jonathan Davis pull me aside and go, Wes, man, I hear you're out of control, dude. And he's like trying to help me, like, there's no stopping me. My drummer would come to my house, we're supposed to have rehearsal, and think I, he would find me dead because I was supposed to be at rehearsal at noon, it's three in the afternoon and I'm passed out on pills. Because of that lifestyle, eventually head crashed and burned. It wasn't too long after that that I ended up in a treatment center because I couldn't control my drink and use it. The best thing about getting sober at first was I wasn't going to die. It was really life or death. I've been a struggling, broke musician for so many years. If you say I could do these 12 steps and change my life, I'm into it. I would go out to shows and I had this feeling in my gut like, ah, I'm supposed to be up there. I didn't know what to do with that. So I got really into prayer meditation saying, if this is who I am, show me where you want me. And I kid you not, within 10 days of starting this awe meditation for manifestation, Monkey texts me out of nowhere. Hey, you want to come play guitar with us? I was like, what the fuck? Are you kidding me? The guy they had had a really bad drinking problem he was hiding. And the guys in Corn had at this time been playing together on tour 18 years or something. They wanted somebody who was sober and had their shit together. I got the best gig of my life because I was sober, because I had a chance to reestablish myself as a good, sober dude. This was me as a 14 year old boy having this dream, losing head, losing it all, thinking, I'll never play again. Finally land this corn gig. I did it all because of recovery. I was just like bawling my brains out. Put me in, coach. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. To get to go back 10 years later and play some of these same festivals we played with Head, but now headlining, and to play it totally sober was the greatest gift I've ever been given in my life. Rock Am Ring 2011. I guess I had a great show because I chipped my tooth, man. You know it's good heavy metal when you're missing bone fragments in your mouth. When I saw the writing on the wall that 
Brian was coming back to the band. I was terrified. I have no school, no nothing. I, I didn't know what I was gonna do. So I went back to that same kind of prayer mantra, back to my prayer and meditation. If I'm supposed to be sober and I'm a musician, I'm not sent here to live a miserable life. How can I help people and make a living? So in that meditation, it came to me. It's not much music in treatment centers. Maybe I could create a program that brought music into treatment centers. And it hit me, Rock to Recovery. And I was gonna go in and write songs with non-musicians and get people to play music who are in treatment. I officially founded the nonprofit on 12 12 of 12 because I figured that date's magical and I told you I'm a 12 stepper. So you have junkies and people hurting and this postman who's vomiting blood and people trying to save their life. And so I just walked in and said, hey, do you love music? Yeah, we love music. Okay, I have this idea. I want to try to have music help you while you're in here. And from the very first session, you could see the magic of how much joy and transformation it brought those guys. So Rock to Recovery today is 13 guys. We do about 500 sessions every month. Our nonprofit has a contract with the Department of Defense and we get flown around the world now to work with wounded veterans. Now we're coming up on our fifth year fundraiser, but we honor sober musicians also in recovery. We have them come out and jam, and we've honored Mike Ness, who sings for Social Distortion, Corey Taylor from Slipknot Stone Sour, and Wayne Kramer from MC5, and Moby, Katie Seagal, what, and John Feldman from Goldfinger. All these incredible guys play on the stage in the name of recovery and raise the money for this nonprofit. It's a trip. There's a lot more magic in music than I even realized. When you play music, even if it's a shaker or a simple guitar part, it engages your whole brain. It acts like mood stabilizers and antidepressants. It acts like pharmaceuticals naturally. I've watched junkies who were literally suicidal like, fuck you, I don't want to do music, why am I here? And by the end of a session are jumping around dancing and singing. And what we do is we talk about the darkness and the struggles and their true emotions, because that's what songs are. And we put them into the song, and then on the course we sing about the hope or the possibilities or the desire and intention we have for our life moving forward. So it becomes like this mantra. When you take a person and they're so hurt and damaged, you just have this crust and you feel like life can never be good again. And playing music breaks through that crust and we get down to that essence of who we are because deep inside everybody still exists that happy childlike playful spirit of the five-year-old dancing down the cereal aisle at the supermarket but we get so lost and far removed from that we forget it's even there and in our sessions I watch people no matter what age reconnect with that glowing childlike spirit so when we're young we're living in our fears and we almost don't realize it and by holding those fears whatever they are from stuff that maybe happened to you as a child trauma otherwise being afraid at school not fitting in heartbreak all that that becomes the energy that really can fuel addiction and isolation and self-harm and mental health issues so it's really about letting what feels like the darkest most secretive parts of your life out If you're watching this and you're struggling, you probably feel like it's never gonna get better because that's how I felt. And that's just not the truth. What you don't wanna do is make a permanent decision for a temporary situation. We lose so many people to taking their own lives. And I want you to know that I felt the same way you did, lost, like it was never gonna be good again. There was no way out. There was certainly no way life would ever get good again and that's why I'm here sharing with you today there is a way out and what I found is I have to connect with other people and share my story and what I found is that when I connect with other people that are going through the same stuff I've gone through the same stuff I'm going through they can help give me strength and guide me to that next day that next moment that next hour and in time those hours and days build up and we start finding our way out and we can get into a solution You are not alone. There are people 
just like you that would love to help you and show you how they found a way out the same way so many people showed me how to find a way out. You matter, you're needed, and you rock.